I think because the time is, is rather short, uh, I give you the word and let you start about the Open Trip Planner. Yeah, you just okay. uh, start, uh, Andrew. Sure, yeah, I can go ahead. So uh, I'm Andrew Bird. I'm one of the founders of Conveil and have been working for, I guess, over a decade on Open Trip Planner. So uh, yeah, the founders of my, my company, Conveil, we were all creators or contributors to open source routing software and started building Open Trip Planner in 2009 for a US transit agency in Portland, Oregon, uh, with a US federal government grant. Uh, at that time, we were still part of a nonprofit in New York, but basically uh, building open source routing software at the time, people were rather dependent on closed source options where they couldn't uh, get the features they needed. And we were working with some agencies who were uh, early creators of open data and open data standards. In fact, the uh, the GTFS that's used in a lot of places was created by this TriMet agency in, in Portland. And so they also wanted some open source routing software in kind of the same spirit uh, to, to work together with the open data concept. And uh, so we've been involved in the uh, open source routing and open, open transit data since that time. And uh, so this project has been in continuous development and use for almost 12 years now. And uh, several of us have been working on OTP that entire time. So uh, it's been in production usage in Portland since uh, at least 2013. And around that time was when we really started to get some international uh, usage. That's when we started working with the uh, transport ministry in the Netherlands. There were several companies in the Netherlands doing uh, routing and with people who were generating the open data set for the Netherlands, which at the time was one of the best anywhere, maybe still is. It's very complete and good quality. So uh, we were working with them on adding real time capabilities, uh, scaling up to larger data sets because the system was originally made for uh, medium sized single cities and we had to take it up to the national scale. And uh, so that was a, there was a lot, period of rapid growth there where I think Open Trip Planner uh, uh, started using, um, started being able to handle larger data sets, and uh, where we started adding capabilities that sometimes didn't exist in other other systems, just weren't available, like having these uh, truly real time updates with uh, vehicle positions or delays being applied and and visible in the routing results immediately. Things like that were pretty experimental new stuff at the time. So uh, starting from that time, uh, I was the primary contributor and development community coordinator for OTP for several years, uh, adding all that kind of stuff we were talking about, uh, I was just talking about, and also prototyping some better performing algorithms for dealing with the larger networks and data sets, uh, which didn't get into the OTP code base right away. They were used for some of uh, more internal stuff at Conveil, but they did eventually inform the design of OTP2. And uh, so after after several years of development, we the, started seeing even more usage in the European context uh, in Finland and Norway and uh, Ruter and Entour in Norway, uh, headed up the development of OTP2. So taking some of these uh, prototype ideas or uh, more efficient routing that we had developed and uh, turning that into the second version of OTP2. And uh, they've been leading that for the last couple of years. And I'm still working with them several times a week on, on this new version in collaboration with people uh, in the US, in Europe, uh, all over the place, really. So uh, yeah, OTP is already used to provide uh, trip planning in quite a few locations around the world. As far as I know, it's still behind some fairly large international trip planning uh, mobile apps or served as infrastructure for bootstrapping some others and uh, is, is part of official trip planners in several, several places. So we've got some real momentum in the development of OTP2 now. Uh, collaboration between different metropolitan regions and countries uh, and uh, released the 2.0 version, as you probably know, 
late last year. So um, I imagine you're probably familiar with what the or some some of the details of the project and how it's used. If there's anything you don't know or you want to would like me to answer, and maybe better be be better to proceed with uh, questions or question and answer because I'm not entirely sure what you know and what you don't know. But uh, maybe I will let the guys from Entour uh, do a little more presentation and then we could, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does that sound like a good plan? Yes. Oh, that, that we that you yeah. now do the first presentation and then question and answer. Okay, yeah. cool for us, I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I can uh, go through. Uh, well, you had some of the background and uh, and uh, the basics of the Open Trip Trip Planner project from uh, Andrew, uh, and I can go through how we have kind of uh, used uh, OTP in Norway. Uh, and uh, I guess the same as Andrew said, it's, it's kind of difficult to understand exactly what you are looking for. So I will try to keep this as a kind of like a fairly high level uh, presentation of how we have been thinking about uh, taking OTP as a very strategic choice in Norway and uh, some of the work we have been working with. And, uh, and I'll try to touch upon most of the subjects uh, that were asked for and uh, then we'll probably have some time to have some questions at the end and then we'll take it from there. All right. Cool. cool. Uh, let's see. All right, you see my screen now, right? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> looks good. All right. Uh, I figured it would be nice just to give a, a kind of a short overview of uh, what we do in Norway and how we uh, use uh, OTP also with respect to the data uh, we feed into OTP. Uh, so just to give you like a very brief introduction about N2. N2 was established uh, fairly recently in 2016. It's a government owned company and uh, we have the responsibility for all public transport data uh, and national journey planning for the whole of uh, Norway. Uh, additionally, we have the national ticketing system for all public transport. Uh, so that's also part of our responsibility. This ticketing system is mandatory for the rail sector uh, and it's optional for the rest of the public transport sector. Uh, and two, it is also responsible for uh, customer support for the rail sector in Norway. Uh, and uh, we have a fairly large uh, technical department, so it's quite a lot of uh, work going on and uh, development going on on the different elements of public transport. Um, before we go into the details of OTP, uh, I find it often uh, relevant to just give you a brief overview of how the data flow in our system, because I think this is quite important for why we chose to use Open Tri Trip Planner in Norway. <clears throat> and also very relevant to the choice we made that we use NetEx and Siri uh, as, uh, as formats in Norway. So this is basically uh, uh, an overview of how we collect and uh, integrate all the public transport data in Norway. We have uh, a lot of uh, PTAs and PTOs uh, around Norway. Uh, they are responsible to maintain all their stops in the National Stop Registry, which M2 is responsible for. They are also responsible for uh, sending us uh, NetEx data for their planned public transport services to N2, which we collect. This is all done in the NetEx format. So this is something we basically went all in on about five years back. And they also send us all their real-time data on Siri, uh, which we also collect uh, at N2. So we will feed all this data uh, still uh, in NetEx format into Open Trip Planner. So both the stops, uh, the, the planned uh, timetable data and the real-time data. 
into Open Trip Planner and we expose a fully open national journey planner API for the whole of Norway. So basically uh, the way it is today, most of the major journey planning systems in Norway, uh, so the different operators uh, apps are using our journey planning API uh, for th their services. And if you look at the figure here, you probably see that uh, as say that we have Open Trip Planner uh, 1.x. Well, it's a version of uh, uh, the, the earliest version of Open Trip Planner, and we also have 2.0. So currently, we are actually running both the uh, one, the version one of OTP and the version two of OTP in production, and we are at the point now where we try to uh, migrate all our consumers over to uh, using Open Trip Planner 2.0, which is a process we will expect to go for quite some time, but uh, we have today about 5% of our traffic going to OTP 2.0. Uh, so we collect about 50 NetX feeds uh, today and probably around 30 uh, Siri feeds. Uh, we have approximately three to four hundred million requests per month being served by our open uh, API for journey planning and and to also hold the role of being the NAP for Norway. So all the data we collect in NetX, we also make available openly both in the NetX and GTFS format and in Siri and GTFS RT format. So this is kind of like a, just a brief overview of how it's it's all connected. And uh, and uh, I guess that the main point here is that we are today at the point where there is basically one major journey planning service for the whole of Norway, which are being used by most uh, operators and public transport authorities. Uh, if we just go back a little bit, uh, Andrew told you about uh, the start of uh, OTP. Uh, when we started with OTP about five years back, it, it was basically based on GTFS, which were uh, the major format being used at least in the US. So uh, input data for the static part was GTFS based and for the real time part it was GTFS RT based and it had uh, both a uh, REST and a GraphQL API uh, going out. So the first thing we have done in Norway that since we went, wanted to go all in, in on NetX, we have to um, build support for feeding NetX into Open Trip Planner, and we also build support for Siri directly into Open Trip Planner. Uh, the NetX and Siri formats are richer than the GTFS formats, so we have also been working quite a bit with a more generic and richer data model internally in OTP to support uh, new features in uh, these formats. And one of our kind of goals all along is that we would like uh, our whole data stream from uh, uh, from end to end to be as harmonized as possible. Uh, so we have also created a trans model based GraphQL API uh, to make sure that we use the same terminology on input data as we do on the API uh, being consumed by journey planning uh, apps or, uh, or similar. <clears throat> So the functionality of uh, OTP1, just to kind of sum it up, this is what we have in production today. Uh, it's basically full multiple routing. Uh, our goal in Norway is that our routing should be as neutral as possible, so we should not uh, have any specific uh, uh, default behavior uh, where certain types of uh, uh, public transport should be uh, prioritized above others. Uh, we have created a lot of functionality for whitelisting and banning of uh, the different types of uh, levels in the data, so on authority levels, online, on service journeys. 
So this is basically because even though we provide a full national journey planner, it might be relevant for other consumers of our API just to uh, create routing on their own data and or certain parts of the data of Norway. Uh, so this has been quite important functionality. Uh, we have a lot of the real time uh, transit updates functionality. So you have, uh, as uh, Andrew also said, uh, the full integration of real time with uh, uh, journeys being calculated based on the, uh, estimated arrival and departure times. Uh, we have support for extra call or extra journey uh, when that's necessary, cancellation and uh, of course textual messages uh, if there's some kind of uh, event that need to be communicated uh, to the end user. And then you have the whole street routing, uh, which has also been worked a lot of in OTP. So the full foot, bike and car routing. Um, and we also have uh, height data to be able to adjust walk and bike speed according to uh, the topology of your area. Uh, we have been working a lot with interchange or transfer, so being able to provide that between these two specific journeys, there is a guaranteed connection, uh, giving more kind of trust in the public transport system and some quite a bit of functionality around uh, different combination of uh, using park and ride, kiss and ride, ride and kiss, being able to kind of hook taxi services in uh, on uh, first or last mile of uh, a public transport uh, trip, basically. Uh, of course, with the mobility uh, sector, uh, city bike integration has been important. So this uh, we have this uh, several places in Norway and we have been working quite a bit with uh, DRT services or flexible transport as it's called in the NetX world. So we have support for some of the use cases uh, there, but this is uh, a lot of work in progress on this part. So we have been in production with OTP1 for quite some time, but we have uh, all along been aware that uh, OTP one uh, is not kind of the <laughs> the end solution here because it does have is kind of flaws to put it that way. Uh, it's been developed for many years uh, by many people, so it, it has a lot of code, uh, both uh, the good and the bad version of it. And as Andrew mentioned, it was originally built for a city or a region. And when we put in all the public transport for Norway uh, with uh, 4,000 routes and uh, 130,000 stops. We could have worst case scenarios where the calculating uh, a journey could take up to 10 seconds uh, going from all the way south to all the way north of Norway, for example. Uh, so this very much relies on the, the ACE star search algorithm, which OTP1 is based on, which again relies on the performance on a single thread, uh, which is kind of a a limit that is difficult to uh, uh, to address, and uh, the calculation of a journey in OTP one is basically one complex cost function. So you don't have uh, functionality for a full multi-criteria search where you can provide the best routing, uh, best trip option, uh, for example, for the least uh, walk. Uh, lease transfers and so forth. So so this has also been something that we really want. So about two years ago, we started actively in Norway to develop uh, OTP 2.0. And we've been working on that together with Andrew and other members of the OTP project uh, to uh, to make this uh, progress forward. And uh, we are come quite a far away. So we basically have refactored quite a bit of the whole uh, code base. Uh, and one of the major changes uh, is that the A star algorithm for the transit search is replaced with a new uh, algorithm called Raptor. Uh, we just have some major uh, advantages. Uh, 
So basically, it improves performance uh, a lot. It's kind of difficult to compare, but we kind of say that we are talking five, ten times uh, the performance, at least in a lot of uh, some specific use cases. Uh, it enables parallel searches, uh, which is very beneficial in a lot of use cases, and it also have multi-criteria possibilities, uh, which we are working and uh, testing a lot of on in these days. So, so there have been a, a major uh, refactor work and uh, we have also tried to kind of uh, make o, uh, OTP 2.0 more kind of targeted to what, what is it actually meant to solve and our, uh, our, our goal there is that OTP2 should basically work on journey planning, not other types of uh, uh, use cases, which uh, it probably could, but we try to kind of target it towards journey planning solely is kind of uh, our uh, goal. And of course, uh, OTP2 uh, OTP is, uh, is an open source project driven by a community which is both in Europe and in the US. And one of the, uh, the key things of making this work is to make OTP uh, compliant both with GTFS, which is uh, widely used in the US, and uh, NetX, which is becoming more and more relevant in uh, European countries. So this has been very important that we we need to find ways where we can uh, make OTP uh, compliant in both those worlds, to put it that way. <clears throat> I believe one of your questions for uh, uh, on-demand or DRT services. So as I said, we already have uh, quite a bit of support of on-demand traffic today, and we have this in production in Norway. Uh, and uh, I guess our focus here is that we want to integrate on-demand routing in your everyday journey planner. So, uh, so we need to have a, we need to look at it as uh, just uh, data about your service, and it needs to be integrated seamless in your journey planning. So, this is just an example for our our own client today, uh, where. You have a, a journey uh, going from uh, A to B, and you will find options with uh, normal, uh, traditional, timetable-based uh, routes. Uh, but then you also, in the middle here, have a, a polygon-based service, which actually needs to be pre-booked. So this uh, is some of the work we are working with is to integrate this so it's a part of your journey planning and this is very important in Norway uh, especially because uh, certain well a lot of parts of Norway it's much more economically viable to run uh, uh, on-demand service than actually having uh, uh, almost empty uh, bus running on specific times every day uh, so, so this is something we, we do put a lot of effort in in Norway. And here I think it's important to point out, um, as I think you asked, that when you look at this from OTP's point of view, uh, we are only talking about the routing. So the availability, reservation and booking is kind of held outside OTP. So this will be services on top of OTP, not necessarily in OTP. So uh, I think this is an important point of view because uh, <clears throat> one of the problems we see is that if you try to put all the functionality you want into one service, uh, it ends up being something that is uh, half good on everything instead of being very good at exactly what it does. Uh, so, so that's why we are clear that uh, OTP OTP's main goal is to be a, a journey planning system, not all the extras which you can do separately. All right. Uh, of course, when you look at uh, the public transport uh, sector today, uh, the mobility and uh, the micro mobility is taking a greater role. 
So we are doing quite a bit of work uh, integrating mobility services. Of course, we have a lot of the city bikes already in place, but uh, we have also been working to uh, create support for free, fo free floating services such as e-scooters uh, and of course uh, free floating city bikes and also shared cards options. So uh, we have been working lately with uh, GBFS integration into OTP and made quite good progress there. So this, uh, this at least is something that we will do in Norway and uh, I guess that's relevant to some of your questions regarding some of the other standards uh, that you mentioned. Uh, I believe TOMB is one of the other standards for similar purposes. Uh, we have uh, for now been focusing on using GBFS at least in Norway. But there's a lot of work from different parties uh, on, uh, on this area. And uh, of course, uh, the roadmap of, of Open T, Open, Open Trip Plan 2.0, it's kind of difficult to give a very precise roadmap. Uh, I guess that the point here is that uh, we had the first official uh, version of o OTP 2.0 already. Uh, I think it was late last year, so November or something. Don't remember exactly. Uh, and uh, and and uh, we are still kind of in the migration phase, uh, at least in Norway, to to kind of uh, move away from the old OTP one uh, uh, version we have running and move everything over to OTP two. So that's at least major focus in Norway. So, but if you want to kind of add up at least what's on the immediate roadmap. Uh, one of the main points is that we are still uh, some small elements uh, lacking to be completely feature complete with uh, what we expect uh, from the functionality we have in OTP1 today. Uh, we will be using a lot of focus on integrating micro mobility uh, going forward and uh, DRT services to create more support for new use cases is also a very important point uh, for our part. And at least in uh, Norway, since we have a, a large role uh, within the rail sector, there are quite a bit of specific functionality, which I don't know if this is relevant or not for other parties, but uh, uh, that we need to focus on um, towards the rail sector, which we need support in OTP too. And of course, uh, since OTP is an open source project, there's a lot of things going on. There are many people who have different views on what they want to extend uh, Open Trip Planner with. And uh, as, as Andrew also mentioned, the, the, the traction around OTP2 is really picking up, uh, as of course uh, this meeting is uh, an example of. Uh, so, um, so there are many parties who are uh, developing and looking at features here, and so you have a lot of other use cases which I believe will be on the roadmap in this future. Uh, so, but it's very difficult to be very precise on exactly what that is because that kind of differs depending on who you are talking to. Uh, but, but the way we have done this today, that is that uh, and two and. Uh, uh, in Norway, we have taken a, a large role in developing kind of the core features of OpenTrip Line 2.0. And going forward, we really hope to, uh, to get more uh, traction in the whole community around OpenTrip Planner so we can uh, have more parties being actively involved in the development going forward. Uh, so, so this is um, something we are working actively with, and I think one of the the key success factor here is also that we have been using quite a bit of effort to have a, a good uh, process of how we actually integrate new functionality into OTP two. So, uh, so this. Um, uh, so we, we can assure the quality uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. All right.
Um, topics will not touch. I just put this up at the end. Uh, I believe you asked for support for OGP or open journey planning. Uh, <clears throat> definitely a long term goal on the roadmap. Uh, it will not be a focus from Norway's side. Uh, but uh, it's something that uh, I believe several parties uh, using OTP are interested in. Uh, and when it comes to the specific standards you mentioned, I understand you are running VDB 431 uh, in Switzerland a bit. Uh, I don't have any information about any work going on on these. Uh, of course, this is from understanding trans model base, so it's for probably not very far away from uh, NetX, but uh, I don't have any specific information there. All right, so that was uh, basically uh, a very short uh, walkthrough of how we have been working with OTP in Norway. Um, I might just, uh, I think one of your points, and if, if I understand correctly, uh, you are kind of looking in Switzerland which way to go, uh, if you should stick with some of the um, the providers of these uh, services uh, you have today, or if you want to move towards um, using systems such as OTP and being actively develop, developing this. Uh, I can just say that it's very difficult to give kind of like the pros and cons in such a scenario because you have kind of one option is to go out on the market, uh, have a specification and get someone on the market to provide it to you, or you could continue open development on an existing system together with the community. And this was at least the same kind of uh, decision we had in Norway uh, five years back. Uh, should we continue using uh, our Hakon system, which we had back then, or should we uh, have uh, start uh, building everything based on open source software? So we basically chose going towards the open source software uh, way. And from my point of view, going through this process, I think it's very important not to look at uh, functionality specifically, uh, because uh, that's not really the right way to choose. In my point of view, I think it's more um, the whole process because if you if you have a big vendor and you purchase this on the market you have someone you can always uh, ask for assistance and uh, change to the system and all that but you might be losing some of the insight and being able to very flexibly adjust your system along the way so it's kind of two different worlds, uh, how you work with this. And, and this was at least the viewpoints we did in Norway that we uh, we wanted to have full control of our system that runs journey planning uh, for Norway. And the only way we could get this full control was to uh, do it ourselves and, and be ourselves responsible for uh, the code uh, running the system. And this was probably the reason why we uh, ended up uh, going towards using OTP and uh, are co-developing uh, OTP uh, today. All right, uh, that was a walkthrough of this uh, from our point of view. I hope this give you some insight in uh, our reasoning for using Open Trip Planner of, and some of the basic of what Open Trip Planner is and what it can be used for. Uh, so uh, I guess we can move over to see if we have any 
specific uh, questions or topics you would like to discuss? There are already a lot of questions in um, in the chat, so if we could work through these first. All right, let's see. Then I should just to start uh, start at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, how good is uh, OTP with uh, accessible routing? That was uh, something we didn't mention uh, in the presentation on this. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are functionality for uh, accessibility routing. Uh, OTP basically uses your data from OpenStreetMap. So when you look at uh, accessibility routing, uh, it really depends on the data that you feed in. Uh, so uh, it, it's difficult to give how good it is. Uh, it depends on your data and there are definitely more features that also needs to be developed if you want a full uh, accessibility routing in your journey planning. Um, but for basic usage, I know, for example, in Finland, they use uh, uh, the accessibility routing in OTP in the national uh, journey planning. So that might be uh, one option to check this out. <clears throat> All right, and then um, when availability reservation and booking are kept outside, how is it linked to OTP? Do you use fair requests? I guess the main point here is that uh, um, our main focus for DRT service in OTP today uh, is to be able to show to the end user that uh, here is an option that is relevant for you. And then it's more focused towards deep linking or something similar to uh, the actual system for reservation or booking. This is not a super advanced model, but uh, that has, has at least been the main focus uh, for our use in, uh, uh, in Norway uh, as of now, for example. <clears throat> Did that answer that question? Yes, thanks. How does the sign architecture support getting new data types into the system? Can I just hook data from outside without reaching in the core? That might be a question uh, Andrew or Thomas could uh, try to answer. Uh, Thomas uh, worked on that a lot, but uh, I can give the high level answer which is just that if we're talking about the schedule data or the transit data there's a separate internal model and gtfs and netx data are both mapped into this um, shared internal representation so if there were a third type of or fourth type of uh, transit data those could uh, just be mapped into the internal model assuming that they are similar enough if if of course it implies objects or functionality that isn't there, then it would be more difficult. But if it's just coming from a different source, it can be mapped in. Uh, Real-time data is going to be similar. I'm not as sure how straightforward the mapping of different real-time data sources would be. Uh, Thomas would know more of the details, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but we also have, we have different type of data. We have data that is used uh, uh, in the routing process and then we have more complementary data and adding at least in some cases we have added uh, like notices that are decorating the uh, uh, itineraries that we return. Uh, adding search data is quite simple. There is also a uh, we call it a sandbox model that uh, that people can use to add their own uh, data or models as long as it doesn't 
integrate heavily with the routing, it's no problem. Uh, when it integrates heavily with the routing, then it becomes more of a discussion how to integrate it. But we, I've, so far, we have solved all solved all those cases, I think. But it is a bit of a development work. To there is no general purpose data store in OTP, so we have to do a little bit of work to integrate uh, new data. I'm not sure if that was uh, understandable. Uh, and then the answer is going to depend on which type of data exactly we're talking about, but there's been some effort into making sure it was possible to connect different data sources. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe tell Saba about the process if uh, uh, someone has a request uh, which needs some change in the core. How do we handle that? Yeah. Do you mean uh, like the development process as in sort of uh, the, the process for yeah, collaborating yeah. on this? The, the, the process on collaborating. Yeah. Okay. The, there the uh, sandbox concept may be relevant. We do have, uh, in order to allow people to develop things uh, more rapidly, we we do allow code that meets certain requirements to just be merged pretty readily. If it's if it's in a completely separate packages and doesn't interfere with the core of the system, there are certain conditions where it's possible to run ahead pretty quickly with getting new code added to try out new things. Um, if we were trying to do something where, if we if we ran into a case where we had to make major changes, I mean, if we're talking about importing transit data, for example, I think we could end up importing a data um, data source that just you know was not possible to convert into the internal format. Um, probably, if we ran into that situation, I think the first thing we would do is just discuss, sit down and discuss it at one of the weekly development meetings and uh, evaluate together what has to change in the internal model so that it covers all available data sources. But there, there are regular opportunities uh, several times a week to start talking about these things if we need to collaborate. OK, thank you. All right, that was, is the Norway instance the biggest OTP in existence? Uh, don't know, uh, probably would expect it. Uh, also depends on, on the definition right. of biggest. Um, the, there'll be several different metrics, right? I mean, you have the most complex network or the most uh, most trips or vehicles or the largest geographic area or the largest number of requests uh, served. And Norway is probably up there in all of those categories. Um, I recently learned that there's a Belgium, there's a, uh, the, an official trip planner in Belgium now that is also based on OTP. Um, and there have been ones running in the Netherlands. So those may be similar in network complexity or data input data size could be getting similar. Uh, the geographic area may be important in some cases. The fact that the Norway one is covering a large geographic area with some slower modes like uh, ferries that, that create some unique circumstances. So probably in the complexity and uh, com complexity of the search process and all, all these measures of complexity in Norway is probably pretty high up there with a few other cases. But it's also important to consider that we will never know what what is truly the largest deployment because as an open source project, it can be used by anyone. And up in, even relatively recently, I was, there are there have been cases where it was used by mobile applications that were being used in you know, dozens of cities all over the world. And we may never know whether that's the case or when it's happening, so. Uh, part of the challenge there is that people are people can use something without uh, without actually uh, informing anyone or or even contributing back to the project and 
so that that happens but maybe that's not really relevant for this discussion as far as cases we know about where people are contributing norway is certainly the prominent one uh, and also some something related uh, related to the ogp um we did a proof of concept uh, a year back uh, when uh, we add uh, the data from uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland into our OpenShift planner, uh, planner planning as a proof of concept, uh, and uh, that's worked uh, very well. Uh, and what is the need for you to have o OJP? Um, is it uh, to have some uh, co cooperation, uh, have add some data from the neighboring country or something? Uh, then uh, and also an option is to uh, add the data uh, into your uh, OpenShift planner. And maybe that is a better solution for your citizens. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can discuss in details here. So I guess we will just run through the overall uh, part now. Uh, and then uh, there was a question about extension of plugin management architecture, and I think you answered that, Andrew. Yes, that uh, is uh, the sandbox feature, which is uh, quite important. And then there was a question about maps, uh, what maps can be used in OP. Uh, it's basically OSM, uh, which is supported. I don't know if there's any other map options that you have heard of, Andrew. I guess it also depends. Whenever you talk about maps, you can talk about the visual display of maps or the routable, uh, the information about the topology of the network and everything. And in our case, we're usually using OSM for both of those. It's from two different sources. So the visual design of the maps, uh, in order for it to match the, the network, would usually be from an OSM mapping source. Could be tiles or vector maps, or there are several commercial providers or, or uh, open source solutions for rendering all of that. And then the import of the street network data is generally from OSM. It would actually be not too complicated to import it from a different source if you wanted to. But in especially in Europe, the OSM data is so good that there's often no reason to get it from anywhere else. And it's also editable. So uh, if there's never a problem with something, it's pretty straightforward to go directly to the source and fix it. Yeah, uh, I can also mention there that uh, OTP support elevation, importing elevation data. And uh, I guess also we support uh, pathways, uh, GTFS pathways, which is rele relevant. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and did you use real time road data somewhere already? We are not using that in Norway. I don't know if there's any other deployments who use that data from my point of view. Please. No. Not, not that I know of, but no. it, I don't think there's we, we've had some sort of prototype systems for updating the speeds on the roads. Uh, that's another thing that would be pretty straightforward to do if you had the data source and it was matched to the IDs of the roads and everything. But it's it's going to depend on very local circumstances. It isn't something that is a standard feature used at, at scale yet. All right. Uh, and how many core committers does OTB have? I think that's, I guess that's a difficult question, but... Uh... Depends on the definition. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I mean, yeah, there are what probably f four or five people who are very regularly sitting in meetings and and making taking some action every week, and then there are people uh, working on forks or branches at at businesses that make use of OTP in other places. So. They might show up more occasionally when there are uh, changes to be merged and discussions happening. But if you want to get a sense for that, probably looking at the uh, documentation on the committee and at the activity on the GitHub uh, issues and pull requests would give you a sense of, of how that works. All, um, pretty much everything that happens is visible somewhere. Uh, you also see some commits from say people at Entour who are fixing things or working on things who are not necessarily in every meeting and but 
they and are not necessarily commenting on everything but uh, you'll see there are additional people around who are contributing as part of the same organizations yep and how do you manage data quality for otp who is responsible for good data quality uh, i can only ask as for norway but basically uh i'm going to show the the data flow uh diagram earlier we have quite a extensive validation pipeline uh, so all the netx data we collect go through this validation pipeline when we do a lot of checks both in terms of uh, technical uh, checks towards the standards and the nordic profile which we use in norway but also logical checks to make sure that the quality meets certain uh, requirements so basically we expect that uh, the data quality is kind of taken care of when it's fed into otp that's at least how we do it in norway yeah for, that's for the transit data for the street uh, data we rely on the otp validation that, yeah. that makes a, a report that is quite detailed so we yeah, can go in and fix fix the OSM data. So we, when we started using OTP in Norway, we did have quite an extensive uh, work on uh, on uh, bringing the OSM data up to a certain level of quality. Then we used uh, the validation in OTP quite heavily to uh, to kind of uh, identify what we needed to uh, pick and address. <laughs> OSM uh, data. Mm. All right. Uh, so your open API on the customer side is not OJP for the time being. Yes, that's correct. That's not OJP. Uh, I think our viewpoint on OJP is that this will be a separate API, which will be developed uh, in uh, uh, in the future. All right, how many people work on OTP to run it in Norway? Uh, it's kind of difficult to say, but it's actually not very many. Uh, we basically have two developers uh, who basically work full time on OTP. Uh, we have uh, streamlined the operation side quite a lot, so we run everything in Google Cloud and we have also everything else at Intuit is running it under the same uh, operation regime in Google Cloud, so, uh, so uh, it doesn't create uh, require too much maintenance work. So I guess you could say between two and four people uh, is basically running this in Norway. With with the additional detail that that's within an organization that has a lot of IT infrastructure. So that would probably be the same at SPBA or somewhere else. But uh, you, I guess you can lean on having other, other software running in a similar environment. Definitely. Uh, the, Maybe indoor routing question. I could answer that one. Uh, the uh, if something is uh, mapped in OSM, it will be used for finding the transfers. So actually, in quite a lot of places, the pathways so within the stations are actually mapped in in OSM, or they can be added. And then uh, there's also the possibility of specifying transfer times in the input data uh, to override that or supplement that. So it, it is possible to get detailed transfer information inside. I, I just wanted to mention I will need to leave uh, uh, right right away in about three minutes. So maybe if we can look quickly at the questions, if there are any that I would be more able to answer, I should answer those right away before, uh, before I run up against my time limit. Certainly. OK, so I'll take a quick look below. Uh, I think I, I probably could comment on comparison with other open source routers, although maybe it's also good to ask uh, Entor because they've had to make uh, decisions about which software to use. Um, and then 
uh, park and ride intermodal routing. I think maybe uh, maybe Thomas would be able to answer that one pretty well. So I'll just talk about maybe to, to wrap up on my side uh, comparison with other routers. Not that I'm familiar with the full range of what's out there, but I worked on several of them and have, you know, at various points worked on things that were projects where the intention was to correct or overcome problems with OTP. So uh, the the original issue with OTP was just the design for a smaller scale. Uh, you know, there was not the the objective originally for it to work at such a large scale as such a real time environment. But I think uh, over the years that has largely been addressed, especially with all the work on OTP2, uh, I mean, the work that Intour has done has essentially brought OTP2 in line with experimental or very single purpose routing projects that we built that were made specifically to be high performance and it is on par or better than that now. So I think, uh, in terms of performance, it is probably completely fine, as good as it's going to get. And then uh, during that uh, during that work, there was also a lot of attention paid to the quality and variety of the results. So the increase in performance was not used just to get higher throughput. It was used to compare and contrast a larger number of results to present to the user. So that has led to an increase in quality. So among open source routers, you know, there, there are different trade-offs that are going to be out there, but OTP2 especially is probably uh, going to be as good as anything else out there at this point, I believe. But uh, that, that will uh, maybe to, uh, I would end on the note of saying that um, the success of that project of you know being able to be to, to development to continue maintenance to continue and for it to continue to serve that role what's going to be important is having a lot of collaboration between different organizations that are using it um, not just using the software but having uh, technical staff who can uh, make their own contributions and coordinate with with other agencies that are using it and uh, so uh, that would be very interesting if uh, SPB does decide to use Open Tripliner to. Uh, it would be great if a, more coordination happened between these different organizations in different countries. So, thanks for inquiring about this. I don't know if you guys want to discuss some more, but I'll need to take off uh, pretty much right away. No, thank you, Andrew, for, for your time. Um, if okay, we go through the rest of the questions. <clears throat> then, yeah. thanks. We can walk through that. And, uh, okay, then thanks. Sorry to uh, sorry to uh, run, but I'll talk to you another time, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. All right. So there is a question about uh, taxis. Uh, we have uh, some taxi features in Norway, however, it's not a full taxi integration. It's uh, it's more uh, a quick fix, to put it that way, where we actually just do a car routing at the end and then we hook it up towards where you can get the taxi later. Uh, there are uh, some uh, places in the world where they have a, a Uber and Lyft integration in production, uh, where it's fully integrated. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, we haven't gone into the detail to look at this uh, in Norway as of now, at least. Uh, do you use user profiles for search? Uh, I think the, this is something we have discussed, uh, but it's not something we have done yet, but it's definitely something we uh, would find very interesting to do in the future. I don't know if you have any things you can add there, Thomas. Yeah, I can just say that the API pretty much expose every knob you can turn. Uh, on so it's you have all the parameters available, but you can't make profiles 
so I would like it would be much more user friendly for a client development if you had user profiles uh, that we could store on the server side, but we don't have that. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then it says you mentioned part and write. When do you show it to the user? Is it a switch request? Uh, yes, we have a park and ride integration. This is basically a parameter in uh, the request. So how we would do this is basically that we might run a normal transit search and then in parallel, it will actually do a transit search, including park and ride as an option for first uh, first mile. Uh, and uh, then you can do uh, some logic at the client side to to kind of uh, uh, make uh, see if this is a good or relevant option and then show it if you want it to be an option to the end user. So it's more uh, how you integrate this on the client side. It's definitely supported in the API. How sophisticated is intermodal routing between public transport and private mode? Uh, this is uh, something we are working a lot with today. Uh, and at least from my point of view, I believe this is one of the, the strengths of OTP2. So basically what is done in, in like technically in OTP2 is uh, you have switched your whole journey into three parts when you search. So it's a, uh, it's an, uh, um, uh, an uh, one part for kind of the first mile uh, access, uh, as we call it. Uh, and then you have the transit part in the middle. So that's this is the search where you actually use the public transport network. And then you have the egress part, which is kind of last mile. And you can combine different types of combination in your request for what types of first and last mile you want to use in combination with your public transport uh, in the middle. So uh, this is things that uh, we we have in place on the API and we uh, have quite high expectations for it. Right now we are in the process of kind of understanding how we can take advantage of this uh, fully. Yeah. So this is a lot of uh, trying and finding the best uh, way to to use this. Do you want me to comment on details there, or please do? Yeah. So the egress and access are street A star searches. Uh, then we pre-calculate transfers for the transit search, which, uh, which is the transit search is a raptor search, so it's another search engine. Uh, that is implemented in OTP, and that's a many-to-many -many search. So uh, we can pretty much uh, put in any uh, egress and access uh, set of egress and access paths, and then do the transit search. And the performance is not uh, do not depend on how many access and egress uh, you you put in. Uh, and um, the transit part, uh, no, the transfer part in uh, can be, uh, you have to do one search for each mode that you want to support for the transfers. So if you want to search both bicycle and walking for transfers, you have to do two searches. All right, and, uh, and uh, when working on this kind of questions, uh, when we don't know uh, what is the best for the uh, citizens, uh, it's the major uh, benefit of an open source uh, project. And you can uh, try, learn, uh, and uh, change, and try again in a rapidly high, high speed. Thank you very much. We, I think we are through the list of questions. Is there any was last question from the audience? Otherwise, I would thank also you very much for your time and the insights and into the Open Trip Planner.
and uh, then we will will see and discuss this internally. Um, okay, thank yeah. you very much, every, right. for everybody for for their time, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.